In recent years, the field of astrophysics has been filled with conversations about the next big break in the quest for dark matter and dark energy. So much of current physics research is now focused on finding new ways to find dark matter candidates and detect dark energy. But why is there so much fascination with dark matter and dark energy? And what exactly are we looking for when we say we are searching for dark matter and dark energy? Welcome to my two-part series where I put both dark matter and dark energy into context and explain why they are the biggest secrets of the universe in the 21st century. First up, dark matter. There are a couple of starting points for the idea of dark matter. One starts with Fritz Zwicky, a man who is said to have made discoveries in astronomy that we could only dream of achieving during his time. His story started when he arrived at Caltech in the 1920s. He was enamored by the astrophysics frenzy at Caltech, and alongside Hubble made some key statements on the expansion of our universe. On top of the fact that he would later propose supernova to be the cause of cosmic rays and predict neutron stars, Zwicky coined the term dark matter in analyzing the coma cluster of galaxies. Before this particular event, Zwicky, with the help of Walter Bodd, observed that galaxies tend to cluster together. What didn't make sense about the galaxies, which he later observed, was their rate of rotation. Galaxies, especially on the outside of the cluster, were rotating faster than expected. But why is this a problem? Rotational velocities of physical objects contribute to a system having kinetic energy, a cluster of galaxies being the system in this case. Virial theorem states that such energies in a given time frame are equal to half of the system's gravitational potential energy. The kinetic energy associated with the rotation of the galaxies in the cluster clearly did not conform to this relationship. There was more kinetic energy than could be equated to gravitational potential under Virial theorem. To make the point clearer, let's put that in oversimplified mathematical terms. Rotational kinetic energy, according to classical mechanics, is proportional to mass squared radius and squared rotational velocity, whereas gravitational potential energy, in the most basic sense, is proportional to the multiplication of two masses and inversely proportional to radius. Multiple bodies make that more complicated, but it is besides the point. So mass is the single variable affecting both sides of the virial theorem equivalence, but has more weight on the gravitational potential energy. So surely our problem here is that some mass has not been accounted for. This is verified by Zwicky's methods. Quote, from the observed speeds of galaxies moving within the Coma cluster, Zwicky calculated its total mass. He then added up all the light from the galaxies in the cluster and used it to calculate the mass in the form of luminous stars. To his surprise, the mass of the cluster based on the speed of its galaxies was about 10 times more than the mass of the cluster based on its total light output. If this is true, what is the solution? Given that the discovery was made in the 1930s, Zwicky couldn't have had any clue in the whole wide world. But he called a possible solution a name that would stick nearly a century later. Dark matter. But this was not the standalone instance where clear evidence for dark matter was found. Credit must be given to Verisi Rubin. She also discovered that rotational speeds of stars within a single galaxy were uniform, which is contrary to classical mechanics. How could it be possible that stars with less gravitational pull from the rest of the galaxy could have the same speed as those with greater gravitational pull? So with these two discoveries spawned the hunt for dark matter. Now, before we continue, we have to clear up a very obvious question, um, which I think will come to no surprise to any of you. And it is the question, have we found dark matter? And have we actually figured out what exactly Zwicky and Rubin were talking about? And the answer to that is no, unfortunately not. So, is there any other information we can use to figure out a precise definition of dark matter? It's extremely counterproductive to simply state that dark matter is matter which we cannot see, obviously the most convenient, but doesn't really add to our understanding what you're trying to get at here. 
perhaps the label electromagnetically neutral might help, but it hardly entails anything. It just really means that electric fields and magnetic fields don't really do anything to help us observe it. Is there more we can say about its composition other than this? Well, kind of. Depends on what you want to believe. We're quite confident that dark matter is among the weakly interacting massive particles, but even that theory has its doubts and doubters. WIMPs, for shorthand, are technically theoretical particles, but if we are not to classify dark matters at WIMPs at this point in our understanding, uh, it's tough to have a video at all. So let's be more specific on WIMPs. They're not at all affected by the electromagnetic force, which we kind of talked about already, and their effects in terms of forces should not be greater than the weak nuclear force, which would make them baryonic in nature. But really what this is saying is that dark matter is that which can only be classified as having significantly larger mass compared to baryonic matter, which is electrons, protons, and neutrons, and only detected through its gravity. So we're kind of going in circles here nonetheless. Again, no precise definition of dark matter. Perhaps some relief to this worry we have here is the fact that very little of it is predicted predicted to be baryonic matter in between galaxies. But that's really all there is in terms of precise characteristics and properties that we've identified so far. With an imprecise definition of dark matter and nothing else, we might be led to question the significance of dark matter and actually discovering it. Why does it even matter that the dynamics of the universe aren't accounted for at galactic scales? Well, the CMB and the early universe have a lot to say about that, and scientists have figured out through tireless research over the decades that dark matter is indeed quite important as a concept. In the rapid inflation phase of the universe, photons scattered off electrons in a high energy and high temperature environment when atoms had not yet formed. But ever since the universe cooled down and atoms formed, these photons have traveled undisturbed through the universe, observable in the microwave portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. However, this doesn't mean the cosmic microwave background came without any imbalances. First, its notable fluctuations are attributed to the formation of galaxies and supergalactic structures in the early universe. But even more, at large angular scales, if you split up the sky into hemispheres, there are noticeable asymmetries in temperatures, otherwise known as cold spots. This is where astronomers believe dark matter might first come into the picture of the universe. Dark matter, which may have existed in these early stages of the universe, would have significant gravitational effects leading to these imbalances. The idea is that whatever particles constituting dark matter formed in the early universe, and with their gravitational influence would bring together mass which forms galaxies and extragalactic structures. Dark acoustic oscillations, you might call them. Without dark matter, there is a gaping hole in the explanation of the anisotropies seen in the CMB. There's also a lot left to be desired when it comes to explaining galaxy formation in the early universe, which leads us to a new question. Besides the need for dark matter to explain these cosmological phenomena, what effects might we expect to see? Since, in the most general sense, dark matter scaffolds the universe, its effects are seen in many different ways. The most straightforward way is through gravitational lensing, an effect arising from Einstein's theories on gravity, predicting that large masses can cause light to bend significantly. Simply put, light tends to travel in a path that aligns with the imaginary fabric of space-time, which is better referred to as a geodesic. And since mass curves space-time, light often bends around massive objects and creates noticeable effects like Einstein rings in strong cases. In observing exaggerated instances of gravitational lensing caused by galaxies, we can infer that there exists dark matter causing a greater bend of light than would be possible with ordinary baryonic matter. 
Other observation methods for dark matter include investigating the halos of galaxies, which is where scientists believe dark matter is concentrated in a galaxy. Any collisions coming out of this region could give us hints as to how dark matter interacts with baryonic matter. Also, stellar streams could show us the distribution of dark matter in action. If all else fails, the best options are to go back to what helped us discover dark matter, galaxy rotation curves, and cosmic microwave background. With all of this in mind, what is the research telling us and where is it getting us? Now that we have an idea of the expected nature of dark matter and a kind of non-answer for what exactly dark matter is, we are left to look at what modern research offers us, perhaps any clues, pointers, leads, or anything of the sort. With the information we've already identified, a clear starting point for the search of dark matter is to continue looking deeper into galactic structures where dark matter has its most observable effects, more gravitational lensing, stronger evidence, and we might find something in between the cracks within this massive effort. Or we could continue investigations into the CMB, its cold spots, and anything tangible that supports current theories on dark matter's early influences. The upsides are that we can look at the mass ranges, try to narrow those down with continual research, and look for physical properties which we might not have been given before. But reductionism of physical properties in the manner that we might conduct it with mass ranges can only go so far. A limit to how precise you can be with identifying mass properties is the detection of a massless neutrino known as the neutrino floor. A more theoretical approach that we could take to answer our initial question is also plausible. Work on those theories and make it even better. We've obviously talked about uh, WIMPs, weakly interacting massive particles, and they are definitely the strongest candidates for dark matter and definitely a popular theory, if not the most popular, but its longevity doesn't save it from the fact that it hasn't produced a lot of answers for us recently, and that could mean that the scientific community begins to depart the WIMP station for good in the upcoming years, especially with the uh, talk of Axion being very loud nowadays. If you haven't heard of Axions before, they are bosons which contribute to strong interactions by preserving some complex quantum mechanical symmetries, which I won't get into the weeds of. Their relevance to dark matter lies in the fact that their masses are very small and they hardly interact with baryonic matter. They are cold as well, which is checking a lot of boxes we have outlined for dark matter candidates. Perhaps the only thing misses, it, missing is what WIMPs can do, which is predict the behaviors of the early universe quite well and the known abundance of dark matter. Verifying the existence of axions seem to be all that is left for the axion theory, which might be another downside, especially because it's been an uphill battle so far. Astrophysicists have been looking at pulsars, neutron stars, and other stellar objects for axion production. Radio emissions from these objects and looking at high energy collisions that may produce detectable gamma radiation, but the effort is long and hard. Other possibilities for alternative theories to WIMPs are sterile neutrinos and left handed neutrinos, which only interact via gravity. Again, a property we would expect for dark matter candidates. Its formation mechanism seems too complex to sim simplify in a meaningful way here. So I'm going to leave that to rest, but its plausibility shouldn't be underestimated nonetheless. Have all of these possible pathways for research created progress in giving us a definite answer? Well, if we immediately go bigger picture and overlap all of these potential pathways and their findings, uh, we might be tempted to say that we are getting somewhere and we're getting little by little closer to what the nature of dark matter is, but we should be careful in identifying the fact that each distinct pathway has its distinct problems and distinct holes in it. The theories and the more theoretical approaches might lack experimental evidence and verification, and there might exist a worry that narrowing down the ma mass ranges of dark matter or 
looking into the effects of dark matter through experimental research will not really answer our big question on what the essence of dark matter truly is. Uh, perhaps we are more so in search of constitutive facts about dark matter, whereas the experimental portion of our research is only looking around for the 10 to be's of dark matter, or should we say regulative facts. If we are to reconcile these theories at some point, you know, try to fill the gaps between what we have seen experimentally and what we predict theoretically, um, it's important to consider how far we deviate from standard model physics and what kind of new problems arise from that. There, you can go as far as creating a new dark sector of physics that interacts with standard model physics and might smooth out some of the issues that we currently have um, in terms of explaining interactions between dark matter candidates and uh, sort of more of the theory on what dark matter might really be. Um, but there are some very deep questions to ask if we are to do that, like what kinds of properties might we find in investigating the dark sector? Maybe it creates its own new problems as a, the sector itself, and what kind of causal powers might it have over standard model physics? Uh, how might we expect these sectors to interact? So the answer to the question of whether research has made progress in giving us a definite answer is not clear. The theories and observations are in place and seem to be closing in on each other, but there is potential for future research to find more questions than answers. So unfortunately, to conclude this huge investigation into dark matter, we're left with a lot of indeterminacy, and this is going to be disappointing to anybody intellectually curious about this topic. And the next question is always going to be, where do we go from here? How do we resolve this issue? And can we take out something positive from what feels like huge negative in the fact that we really don't know that much about dark matter after all? Here's my attempt to alleviate a little bit of your disappointment. Dark matter is anything but an ordinary element of our universe. Its known properties, or lack thereof, are elusive, but its enormous presence and significance in astrophysics are clear and definite, from the quantum to the galactic level. This provides scientists with a clear path to converge on finding dark matter, leveraging the power of both extensive theories and experimental observations or data, despite the immense possibilities. If that's not enough to alleviate your disappointment, Perhaps I should increase your curiosity on this matter. Finding dark matter entails discovering only 25% of our universe's secrets. But where does the rest lie? That, my friends, is in dark energy. The topic of the next episode. Welcome back to The Ephemeris, ladies and gentlemen. I just wanted to make a quick note at the end of this video to all of my returning viewers who have not seen a episode of The Ephemeris for a few months now. I sincerely apologize. Um, the time I was afforded to make these kind of videos when I started this channel, I don't really have any more. I'm um, getting really busy with... Uh, other things in life and so I have not found a lot of time to create content and so summer has turned out to be the best opportunity to create more videos like these and so I'm planning to just uh, do that a lot more in the upcoming months at least for the next one or two months I will try to get um, the next video in this series out as well as maybe one or two more long form videos um, I'm currently thinking of doing a sort of season three format with the uh, short form content that I usually put out and kind of just doing briefs on some news that might come out in terms of you know like astronomy astrophysics all that good stuff and so that's kind of the plan um, it's not a guarantee that I'll be able to get out all these um, pieces of content that I'm thinking of at the moment but um, the hope is that I'll be able to do that before 
life gets busy again. So yeah, once again, thank you for viewing this episode of The Ephemeris, and I hope to see you again. Peace.